Hello and welcome to this, the final part of our series on Tom Wright's book, God and the Pandemic. We're really glad you are joining with us either this morning or catching up a bit later. Today we are focusing on chapter five of the book, and as ever, this chapter is packed full of insight and challenge. As we've been reading through the book, we have been asking lots of questions about what we can do in response to the pandemic. And we've covered so much in terms of helping others, of learning from Job's friends, and not trying to come up with simple answers where there aren't any of reading the events of the world in the light of Jesus's death and resurrection, of joining the groaning of creation when we have no words, of allowing God to work all things for good through us. And today we return to the theme of lament. It feels somewhat apt to finish this book as we mark the year anniversary of the first lockdown, as it seems a good time to consider amongst other questions posed in this final chapter, where do we go from here? Wright makes many suggestions about how we can live in the present and how we recover. But first and foremost, he says, we must take our place humbly amongst the mourners as we grieve all that has happened. The disbelief at the number of people who have died, the painful partings and the unspoken goodbyes, the loss of what was known to us as normal, the separation from family and friends, the missed celebrations. And as with the chapters before, Wright points us to Jesus's own life and ministry to help us approach this task of lamenting. Thinking about Jesus standing at the graveside of his friend, we notice before he does anything, he weeps, he grieves, he lets his sorrow be known. And this, says Wright, is the kind of strength that we need for this time, a strength that doesn't just bury its head in the sand or maintain a stiff upper lip but rather a strength that is willing to both learn and teach the language of lament. A strength that prays the Psalms and practices waiting on the Lord, expecting neither easy answers or easy words to say to the world. But of course, this is no small task. And Wright explains it can be bitter anguish to live with the summons to lament. But it is a necessary part of the journey, for this is the place where we are conformed to the image of the Son. It is in this place that we are called to watch and pray with Jesus in Gethsemane. And this is a really thought provoking concept because we can't read the Gethsemane passage and not feel moved by the weight of the burden Jesus felt as he awaited capture and the cross. But he was willing to do it because things weren't as they should be. And so this is a poignant call for us to now stand in the gap between what Christ has already achieved and the full coming of his kingdom, when everything will be as it should be. This can be challenging and confusing, even disturbing, and it means at times we will face great darkness just as Jesus did. But he is no stranger to the pain and agonies we feel. He experienced his own and draws near and enters into our pain with us. And so we lament and make known not only our sorrow, but also God's sorrow, as he grieves the things we do too. Jesus wept at the tomb of his friend, agonised in Gethsemane, cried out on the cross that he'd been abandoned. That was how the kingdom was established and how it will continue to grow if we have the courage to follow Jesus' example. As we've seen before, though, we don't just read events in terms of Jesus' death, but also his resurrection. And Wright takes us on in the Easter narrative to examine, as well as lament, what is the calling of the church at this time. He demonstrates through familiar passages how the church's mission began with tears, locked doors and doubts, drawing a parallel with the tears, locked doors and doubts that many, if not all of us, have been and are living with. He begins with Mary Magdalene weeping in the garden outside Jesus's empty tomb before turning to the frightened disciples, hiding behind locked doors, afraid that as Jesus's followers, those who seized Jesus would soon come after them. And then attention is drawn to Thomas and his unbelief, his doubts, his desire to see for himself. But Wright shows how Jesus's presence changes the mood of lament into action. Jesus appears to Mary, calls her by name and then gives her a task to do, which is to go and tell the disciples that he is alive. 
Jesus comes amongst the disciples in the locked room and commissions them. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And Jesus shows himself to Thomas, inviting him to see and touch his wounds, proving both his identity and his love, and providing Thomas with what he needed in order to be part of God's ongoing mission. The disciples were all impacted by Jesus' death and resurrection, and we too have been impacted by death in a magnitudinal way in recent times with the mourning of family members, friends, colleagues, even strangers who sacrifice themselves for others. There have been and will continue to be for a long time to come, flowing tears and weeping, of that I'm sure. We've had to stay behind our locked front doors because of fear that we could catch or pass on this potentially deadly virus. And the darkness that has engulfed so many will have understandably led to questions, uncertainty and doubts. But out of lament, says right, can come fresh action when we allow Jesus to reveal himself to us. This lament and action can be costly. And like Mary, Thomas and the disciples, we will need Jesus's presence with us. But gladly, this is what we promise through Jesus's gift to us, the Holy Spirit. As we confront our own tears and doubts, as well as those of the world, and as the doors start to be unlocked, there is a sure and certain call for us to continue the mission we have always had. As Jesus was to Israel, says Wright, so the church is to be to the world. Wright then goes on to explore how, through past tragedies of plague and war, Christians have sought to do exactly that. Nursing people who are ill or injured, or taking aid to those in need. Sometimes saving lives, sometimes dying themselves. But this is a heritage that Wright argues we need to re-establish, that the church collectively needs to take its place once again as a key provider of care and support for the local communities in which it witnesses and serves. Just this week, there was a news story on the BBC about an endangered bird called the Regent Honey Eater and how there are so few left now that many have forgotten their own song. As a result, scientists are using recordings of wild birds to teach captive bred honey eaters their own song before releasing them into the wild. And this may be a helpful analogy for what Wright is saying here. Maybe the captivity we have experienced offers the opportunity to remember our song so that we can then go out and sing it once more. It's true, there are many non-Christians who care for, support and work on behalf of the sick, the poor, the oppressed. But let's not lose our distinctive voice in the conversation. As Christians, we are called to share in the ministry of helping, healing and bearing the hurt of each other. And Wright challenges us that as government funding is cut and the health service can no longer do all they need to, that it should be churches that step up and help out. There are, of course, many ways to do this, but partnering with mental health services to provide low level local support or joining with a social prescribing programme are just a couple of ways that churches are already responding to this call. And in most cases, initiatives like this have been warmly welcomed, so it just leaves us to ponder what else might be done. And in focusing on what our mission as Ararat Baptist Church can and should look like as life begins to open up again, it's important that we take notice of the particular needs our community has at this time, which may simply begin by standing alongside our community, sharing its grief and helping each other to lament, as well as looking to provide practical solutions and resources. Jesus, in the midst of his mission to the cross, still took time to take notice of people. He was never too absorbed to see the needs around him, so let's seek to do the same. I'm sure we'll be able to come up with a number of suggestions, but Gethin and I and a few members of the garden team have mooted the idea of creating some sort of memorial water feature in our grounds as a space where people can come and remember their loved ones, particularly those they were unable to say goodbye to. Maybe this is something we could think about together as a church. Maybe it would be good to simply hold a day of remembrance where anyone who would find it helpful can come and light a candle and have a safe space to come and lament and share their grief. 
However we respond, it would be great if off the back of reading this book together, we can express our lament collectively and let it lead us to fresh action. So in closing, we return to the question posed right back at the start of the book. What can we do? Wright has shown us there are lots of things we can and should do in response to this pandemic and arguably in other situations where we see immense suffering. Not least of these responses is that we should lament and then grasp hold of the new opportunities for action that emerge out of that lament. We should seek to be signposts that replicate Jesus's own ministry and we should remember our song of hope based on God's faithfulness and seek the help of the Holy Spirit to sing it in as many different keys as is possible. Let's pray. Father God, we pray and ask that you would help us to find a language of lament within our churches and communities, to share with you and each other the pain and hurt, the grief and isolation that people have experienced through this pandemic, whether that be through the shedding of tears, wordless groans or simply silence. This Easter time, help us to watch and pray with Jesus in Gethsemane. And then from this place of lament, use our tears, locked doors and doubts to lead us into action. Open our eyes to new opportunities which allow your church to be to the world what Jesus was to Israel. Help us to keep asking the question, what can we do? and responding in the ways you are calling us to at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.